Welcome to the Parasite Podcast, a show about me and you. We are Venom. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another Parasite Podcast. And once again, we got cameras on this time. And speaking of Cam, we have Cam Fraser here, who was uh, the very nice person who donated pretty much every tie-in to the Big King and Black event to this channel so we could talk about it. And uh, and I'm just excited to have you. So Cam, say hello to everyone. And, uh, and yeah, thanks again for being here, man. Hey. <laughs> yes, nice and simple. Well, we yeah. got a lot of stuff we're going to talk about today, probably. Like any Parasite podcast, we'll probably dip in and talk about Venom a little bit. I'd love to get uh, some of your opinions about some of the, the stuff we've covered over the years because you've told me like in um, you know, email form and stuff like that, but yeah. I'd love to have your opinion shared with everyone else. But then I know we're also probably going to dive into a lot of Spawn stuff. I actually finally caught up today so yep. I could uh, be prepared for our chat. <laughs> Um, also, so what, first I want to start with, like, what got you kind of into this world of like comics, Venom, Spawn, like movie monsters, like what, what was the appeal to you and what age were you like getting into it? Um, I think for a lot of people my age, especially, which I'm about 31 years old, mm -hmm. um, probably the Spider-Man animated series. Okay. Was probably our introduction to Venom. Um as a character anyway, but he was kind of omnipresent, like on t-shirts and stuff. Um, you know, you would see him and no context, you know, <laughs> but he's a cool looking character and he appeals to kids, you know. Um, and then, yeah, with movie monsters, especially um, when I was little, I would um, stay with my grandmother and grandfather during the week and we would go to the mall and in the dollar store back when dollar stores weren't terrible <laughs> um they would have these little books like um you know with the red marker where you would kind of color them and uncover things yes right and uh they had like universal monster stuff cool and so like from a young age like universal monsters and you know venom is kind of a monster so Absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely some sharedness in that. Uh, yeah. Like, because for me, I think it was like Jason and uh, and George Romero zombie movies were like my introduction to monsters, but also Bud Abbott and Lucas Dallo, who met like the mummy and the invisible man. Uh, so like, I kind of grew up on a lot of those two. And I'm like you, like I, I and you're right. I, I think uh, you're one of the few people who seem to openly agree with me. I feel like sometimes I get resistance when I say that Venom appeals to kids and people go, no, he doesn't. I'm like, Yes, he does. <laughs> okay. Full monsters, on. He does. Monsters yes. appeal to kids. Um, yes. When I was like 10 years old, we had this book in my school library called um, Film. You know, the, you know those white books that just have like one line subjects? They're like thin. Yes. So there was one called Film. And in this, and this is an elementary school, K to five. Okay. There's a picture of Freddy Krueger. Whoa. Okay. And I'm like, I want to know who this is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there was a, I, I got, I, I, someone sent me a link once a while ago about kids who grew up on monster movies and they're like, oh, they're likely to be like serial killers and stuff. And yet most of the people I know that grew up on that stuff are YouTubers. Yeah, <laughs> like this, we went a very nonviolent route with our lives. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's because I think what, when it comes to any of that stuff, as long as when you see it, you get a little context that, to know that it's fake. I think yeah. for me with Freddy Krueger, when Freddy Krueger came out, I think I was one of those kids in the eighties that didn't sleep for a week. Um, and, uh, but what they did was I think Robert England went on Johnny Carson and yeah. showed the process of putting on the makeup to, to show everyone like that was the number one night show at that time. And they were like, he's like, it's fake. Like, I'm just a guy like um, Freddie's not real. And they had to do that. The studio made him do that. But still, I thought that was very important to also, grow my love for filmmaking and what goes yeah. into filmmaking. Yeah. Um, did you watch, cause I see behind you, you have Michael Myers, you have Lori, you said, um, and then you have some, some different versions of Jason. So Jason's my favorite movie monster. Had, did you ever watch that like six hour documentary, the crystal Lake thing? Oh yeah. Yeah. Crystal Lake memories. Yes. I, I did that in the nightmare on Elm street one as well, which is I think four and a half hours. Right. Nice. Oh man. I love those. They're great. Um, the, the, the Jason one, I think I've seen five times yeah, <laughs> so I've like, watched it a concerning amount of times myself <laughs> nice yeah when it came out actually when I, I found out it existed 
uh, I bought the first part immediately. And then I think I waited a while before I got part two. And in between those, I bought the book. Um, so yeah, I became really obsessed with learning. I realized, man, I'm a big fan of this, but I don't really, really know that much about Jason. So I, I started doing a deep dive into him. Yeah. When uh, I think I was 14 years old, um, Paramount finally acknowledged the series as a success, you know, mm-hmm. some 20 years after they no longer had the rights to make the movies right. and did like a box set, I think the first box set of the first eight movies. Mm-hmm. And so this, that was like the first time we got audio commentaries for some of the films. Yes. And yeah. um, I think that was also the first time in an official capacity, we saw some of the deleted um, gore for like part seven in particular. Right. Um, so I learned a lot about the movies from that. Certainly. And like the early days of the internet, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I think um, the director commentary and video and commentary on DVDs and Blu-rays are such a valuable thing. I feel um, yeah. there, there are some people that kind of waste it at times. Like I remember the Resident Evil one uh, uh, commentary. There's two tracks. They have one with Miljovic and uh, Michelle Rodriguez, and they're just like having fun. And they're just talking about, Oh, well after this day we went to a bar and, they're telling those kind of stories, but yeah. then they made a second commentary track with just the director and the producers. And in that one, you at least learned why decisions were made. And I think sometimes it's really important to understand a movie is to learn why they choose to do things they do in the film. And, uh, and horror commentary is the best at that. I think a lot of horror yeah. movies have great that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know not everyone's a fan of his, but like Rob Zombie's commentaries are really informative. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think the devil's rejects has a separate one with Sid Haig, Bill Mosley and Sherry moon zombie. Okay. That one's just them hanging out, but sure. it's not terribly informative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are, there are two types of commentary tracks. There's one where it's just people that are like, Hey, on this, like they'll occasionally be like on this day, this was like a nightmare to film. And, yeah. um, but, uh, but yeah, I actually found two of my favorite commentaries are, uh, Batman and Robin with Joel Schumacher. Oh. Um, I actually really love his commentary in that one. Cause he, he breaks down each scene and goes like, okay, so this is why I made it this way. And this is why I fought to make the movie like an extension of the Batman and Robin TV show with Adam West and not go a darker route. And he explains his reasoning. And although you may still disagree with him, I liked hearing him explain it. Um, And then same with, I think it was Brian De Palma on Showgirls. Like that's arguably a lot of people hate that movie, but his commentary on it, he'll, he'll say like, well, the reason we shot this this way is because something was going on over here and the light wasn't set up right. And we had, a, and I didn't have time to move things. And it was just like really interesting to hear him talk about working on that movie. And I was like, ah, I maybe appreciate it more. Do you have a favorite commentary track at all? Um, any- yeah, I was just thinking about that. Um, you know, there's a great one and it's the only way I can watch the movie now. Cause it's, it's not a good movie is um, Freddy versus Jason's commentary soundtrack. Oh yeah. Yeah. With uh, Ronnie, you and, oh, yeah. um, yeah. Robert England and uh, Ken Kersinger. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That one's actually, I do remember listening to that one and it's they do. They, it is a fun commentary. You know, it's funny. I actually think the last two times I watched that movie, I had the commentary on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I tried to watch it without, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's not. It's funny though. Have um, I imagine you've probably been that uh, person like me who dove into the, the versions that were never made. Um, a little bit. Yeah. I read a couple of the scripts back in the day. Nice. Yeah. That was a, uh, it was neat to see what, what could have been. And, and some of those sound like they could have been worse some, somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so having said that, like talking about movie monsters and stuff like, yeah. cause I, I know really what I I'm excited to talk to you about spawn. So I'll, I'll build to spawn. Mm. Um, but for movie monsters and things like that, you said venom is kind of like a movie monster. So is that what appeals to you about the character? Like, are you, are you purely encapsulated by his visuals or, or has the visuals, was that like a gateway to loving the character too? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it took me until reading like comic book runs of Venom to understand and appreciate him as a character sure. because there's so many variations of Eddie Brock between the animated series, like ultimate Spider-Man, the comics, not the show. Right. Wasn't a fan of the show. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Spectacular Spider-Man as well was an interesting variation. I didn't agree with the decision they made at, sure. in the context of... Um, I, I I like the relationship, like, because they kept the ultimate relationship, right, of, like, them being childhood friends. I just... I always thought that 
from my perspective, Eddie Brock is a character. The reason Spider-Man beats him is because he's not as smart as Peter Parker. Right. Yeah. I agree. So it's like, if you make Eddie a competent scientist as well, right. why wouldn't Venom be able to kill Spider-Man? Sure. The symbiote. But yeah. I think if you made ultimate Eddie Brock, like spectacular Spider-Man, if you made him like he didn't get Peter a job with Kirk Connors, he made, he got him a job at like, you know, the daily bugle right. instead. Right. As an intern, that would have made more sense. Yeah, that's actually, a, that's a neat take on it too. Cause yeah, it's, it's keeping his original roots of being a journalist. Um, but if you want to make a, like a, you know, a, a mentorship thing with, but I think with the thing with that is like, Peter has so many mentors in the comics, you know, he has so many like father figures that turn evil. Um, so you got like Norman Osborn, obviously, and, and Doc Ock and, and, uh, and there's been so many versions where they've interchanged those characters. I think in the amazing Spider-Man movies, they made the lizard, you know, and they had Dr. Kirk Connors. So, um, I, I like that though. I think that's a staple for Spider-Man and I think, I certainly think you, you're right. I think that's a, a more accurate, um, up, uh, up to date version of the character than something of where he's just like four years older than Peter and he's a scientist. It's like, uh, yeah, that's not really the character at all. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, cause you know, he could have just gotten Peter like an internship and then been resentful when like Peter passed him. He was Spider-Man and got him fired. Right. Yeah, that's true. Or just, or just, he, he, maybe he's just, he got him an internship and Peter climbed the ladder, got a couple good shots and did, it is now more in the people want his work more like Jonah wants his work more than he wants Eddie's. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, journalism was tough even 10 years ago, I think when spectacular Spider-Man came out, I can't imagine how that would go in these days. Yeah. Journalism's a much different thing nowadays. Um, I mean, there's still people that are the traditional journalists out there and they, and they work hard and they research and stuff like that. And then there's the people that got there because their friend got them the job and yeah. that could be a cool dynamic to play with in a modern setting. I agree. Yeah. It's certainly the direction I would have gone if they introduced Eddie Brock in the amazing Spider-Man films. Oh yeah. Um, there's still people that think that I, I, I don't know if you've heard those theories about, cause someone brought that to my attention not too long ago where they're like, Oh, Eddie could exist in the uh, or this like live action Tom Hardy Venom could exist in the Amazing Spider-Man universe. I go, could it? I have no idea. Could it? Uh, um, I would say aesthetically they fit better in that universe. Sure. I mean, they're, they're both like weird tongue in cheek kind of approaches to the character. Yeah, just the overall. Plus, I mean, Eddie's writing for the Daily Bugle in Venom Let There Be Carnage, right? So it's like there's some version of J. Jonah Jameson, presumably in that universe. True. Um, which reminds me, did when at the end of, uh, well, I don't actually, you know what? I, I didn't mark this episode a spoiler, so I'm not going to talk, talk too much about the end credit scene. Um, but, uh, but I was wondering, there was a, a line about that guy, but I couldn't remember if it was referring to Jonah or someone else, but I don't want to get into spoilers here. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't take it as like recognizing him just necessarily an interest. Oh yeah. Okay. Like, Fair hey, enough. who's this guy? Yeah, there you go. I mean, that's 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 a good actually observation. That could be it. Um, I think it was just there for fan service, and and the line meant nothing really. Uh, <laughs> it didn't make a ton of sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was just like, hey, yeah, whatever. Um, but uh, so, and I'm I'm about to go through this with Resident Evil because Sony just has a they're, they're pretty consistent actually. If you watch their adaptations of things, they're pretty consistent with throwing things in there that make no sense, but they just hey, fans will like it, and you're like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, yeah, so the, the new ones directed by Yo Johannes Roberts, Roberts, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Johannes Roberts. Yeah. He's yeah. uh he did the 47 below movies. I think he directed the sequel to the strangers. Yes, he did. Oh yeah. That's right. That movie that came out like 11 years after the first one. Yeah. But still used the sequel script from two years after the movie came <laughs> yes. out. Right. Right. So yeah. Well, well, hopefully he's when well, he, apparently he's wrote this resident evil also. So Wow, we'll see. I mean, the, the the little character spots they've been doing all week have been pumping me up, and I've been doing videos on them on my other channel. So, I'm I'm optimistic, definitely. Well, hey, if you're familiar with uh, Romero zombie films, I'm sure he's gonna do a lot of scenes that take off from that. Because Strangers Pray at Night certainly had a lot of just like, hey, I've seen John Carpenter movies. Yes. Well, and, well, it's funny because. Uh, Paul W. S. Anderson, who directed the previous most of the previous Resident yeah. Evil movies, he also approached Resident Evil from a John Carpenter slash um, 
I can't remember who directed the Omega Man uh, or Mega Men, but um, he he was like approaching that kind of aesthetic, but yeah. I never thought he pulled it off. Whereas I feel like this director probably could because of the sequel to Strangers. Um, yeah. yeah. So we'll see. He said, because he's apparently going, this Resident Evil, he said his biggest inspiration was uh, Assault on Precinct 13. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, cool. I mean, I like that movie. I do too. <laughs> so fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, with Venom though, like uh, the character, like, you know, what I love about sometimes when I'll hear, hear from you, you will, you'll give me your opinions on stuff. And uh, you'll, you'll, like I said, you sent a lot of cool links, like, you know, free, free codes for me so I can review all these books. Like yeah. I, I always wondered like why, cause it meant a lot to me, but I was just like, I, I was so over Donnie's run by that point, And I didn't want, I didn't want to feel like I was just being negative all the time about his stuff. And I, cause I don't want to project that kind of energy on my channel, yeah. but sometimes I couldn't help, but I just didn't like what he was doing. And, but then you came along and were like, Hey man, here's a, you, I'll give you every code. And I was like, why? Like, I, I just was, it meant a lot to me. So I'm, I'm curious. Well, I, I watched your videos when you were covering absolute carnage. Okay. And I kind of remembered like some of the stuff you liked, some of it you didn't. I certainly agree with the main book. It kind of fell off after the second issue. Mm -hmm. um, but it was like, you know, I've got disposable income <laughs> and okay. I'm a completionist in that regard. So <laughs> I was enough. like, no one else is going to use these codes. So I might as well help out a fellow Venom fan in that regard. Well, it meant a lot because, it, it, like I said, it also gave me stuff to talk about to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And so I saw it as a gift to the channel, which was just meant a lot to me. So I just want to, on video, thank you for that. I, I, had a, I had a blast. And a lot of those books, I ended up really liking. I was like, if it wasn't for the King and Black tie-in, I'd probably love this book. Yeah, I kind of felt that way about a few of the Absolute Carnage tie-ins as well, where mm -hmm. I was like, I enjoyed this more than the more important book that came out the same week for Absolute <laughs> Carnage. <laughs> right. The yeah. uh, Symbiote Spider-Man one for Absolute Carnage in particular, I liked a lot. That was a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that guy who wrote that, I mean, he he's, because I think he's the same writer that did the Scream series. I um, think so. Is it McLeod, I think? And uh, he's got another book coming up, uh, Villains for Hire, where has he put agony on the team? So uh, I'm I'm excited. I mean, he's a, he's a really smart writer and I'm, I, I found myself liking his pacing and style more than the guy who was like, like launching the, the symbiote franchise. And I was kind of like, ah, oh, but I like Venom to me. I always like the small personal stories, the big cosmic stuff. It's great to do it. You have to try different things with Venom yeah. to keep him around. But, but for me, it's just like, it, it, it just doesn't, even though he's a cosmic character, meaning he's from space, but he's also a grounded cosmic character. So I like the grounded stuff more typically. I agree. I mean, I don't think Venom, you know, it's not that he can never do that stuff, but he doesn't, sure. he doesn't need that stuff. Yeah. To be yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. He's like, they're like, he's a guardians of the galaxy. He's a space knight. He's a this. And I'm just like, those are all great ideas. Um, but uh, as long as he comes back to New York <laughs> or San Francisco, you know, <laughs> um, but it's funny. Cause I always talk about characters growing outside of their hamster wheel and even if when I rail against stuff like Donnie does and, and other writers do um, like space night and stuff, I still am like, I'm impressed because I'm like, well, this is beyond what this character was designed for. And yeah. that's great to see the character do that actually. Yeah. I mean, while I was certainly was not a fan of say Mac Cargan as Venom. Sure. Um, you know, you got to try to do new things with the character. Certainly much as I love Venom as a character, a lot of his mini series aren't very good. True. <laughs> yeah. so. as someone who's talked about every single one of them i agree with you <laughs> yeah there's no denying it so <laughs> right no. and, and that's the thing is i tell people when they when they re re critique these movies i go well have you really read venom comics because <laughs> there's not a lot to go off of sometimes yeah I mean, especially for the early 90s early to mid 90s like other than lethal protector and um if you want to count it maximum carnage a lot of it's not very good. Yeah, true. Like yeah. even separation anxiety is a very popular one, but it's not very good either. Yeah, like I my one of my favorites, guilty pleasure wise, is Venom: The Madness, and really it's just because the visual of all the extra heads. I just love mm -hmm. that visual. Um, and then, but the monster is being like this chemical, and they live in a nanoverse. I'm just like, yeah, it's dumb. It's really dumb. 
Yeah, it's one of the ones I haven't gotten to yet because the trade is out of print. Oh, uh, already? The the re, the remade trade? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, because it was in the I think enemy within trade. Yeah, right. Okay. And I guess that one, yeah. I just I keep looking and it's like third party sellers on Amazon, so I haven't been able to go into a bookstore and find it. Yeah, I think they did because that got printed right before the first movie came out. So yep. and those usually have like a two year cycle at the most. So yep. Yeah, well, hopefully, I think, uh, well, I, it's it's expensive, but I think it's in the Ven Omnibus, one of them, um, as yeah. well. Well, they've started doing the Epic Collections for Venom. Oh, yeah, that's right. So maybe you'll get another go at it. Because there's one coming out, in, I think, like, just before Christmas. Yes, yes, there is. That's right. Um, that has, like, the Lethal Protector and the Dark Hawk stuff, all that early stuff in it. Yeah, and something with Ghost Rider, I think, as well. Oh, Spirits of Venom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah sweet. That's a great one, actually. Um, and I know because I'm a Ghost Rider fan, too. Uh, so what other, before we get into Spawn, what other characters outside of Venom in the Marvel Universe or even DC Universe have that kind of appeal to you where either you got in, brought in visually by them or you just ended up liking the character through other means? Reading um, I mean, certainly Batman. Yeah, okay. Like I said, as, as a kid of the 90s, Batman, the animated series, and Spider-Man, the animated sure. series were just my whole childhood pretty much yeah, we're really spoiled to have that sh- cartoon because yeah. there's nothing better than it still to this day yeah no it, it holds up <laughs> yeah it does yeah. and i mean i think mask of the phantasm is still one of the better batman films yes yes it is <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i have uh, i have the original poster from blockbuster video um yeah. that it took me like years to track down i spent like 40 dollars on it um but i have it framed and I worship at its altar. <laughs> Such a good movie. Um, and the comic it's based off of is really good too. The year two comic um, is really yeah, good. I haven't read that, but Tom McFarland drew that, yeah? He, yes, I think he did some yeah. of it, yeah. Um, that's cool, yeah. No, and yeah, speaking of Tom McFarland, uh, yeah, and, and it was funny because Venom, he, like, I fell in love with him, but I, like I said, I grew up on Monsters too. so Swamp Thing for DC and Solomon Grundy, like, I, those are my kind of characters. Like, if, I remember I, went and pitched stuff at dc once and they were like who do you want to write and i'm listing like swamp thing and solomon grundy i'm dead man like i'm listing all these monsters and they're like uh that we weren't expecting that i'm like then you don't know me man (laughs) um but todd mcfarlane he he's such an interesting guy because i almost blindly but but also aware on some level i will support that guy no matter what yeah um i love everything about him so before i go into my spiel about why i love him so much like what is it about his work and spawn or venom or any other thing that appealed to you um i mean first of all it's always cool fellow canadian <laughs> there you go yeah, yeah. um because <laughs> that's certainly like why i would see him on the news and stuff growing up is because like hey look at this successful canadian nice as though people like you know wayne gretzky don't already exist <laughs> yeah. but you got to um, celebrate your heroes you know yeah yeah no exactly i mean i i think that he has a very Todd McFarlane. i mean he has a very particular like style and aesthetic that I, I think is very appealing um it's very of its time mind you yeah the early spawn books no denying that yeah certainly uh rereading the first whatever 50 issues in the compendiums that have been coming out mm-hmm. i was like boy this is aged <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's uh he's like all artists, he's uh, evolved and matured. Yeah. Um, but uh, but it's I still felt like he asked big questions in that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, certainly. And um, you know, I, I think was Spawn to like, it got really big around the movie. Yes. Oh yeah. But you know, it's sort of like seeing the toys on the shelves was sort of I think a lot of our exposure to Spawn because like certainly. I was only eight years old when the movie came out. So in the years before that, it was like, I'm certainly not reading Spawn books at that age. Sure. <laughs> um, but Why not? I mean, like he's a cool appealing character. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, uh, I think my mom, cause I, a lot of this stuff, uh, these aren't memories of mine anymore. So I have to get this information from my yeah. mom and she, uh, she'll, she tell, she loves talking to me about Todd McFarlane. She's like, you've, even pre aneurysm, she's like, you knew you love that guy. She's like, uh, if we went to, she, cause I guess in high school was when I was in high school when spawn came out the movie and yeah. she said, you were just about to get your second job. Um, and she's like, and you literally got that job to buy toys. And, uh, she's like, you, so you just worked at like a CD store, like two days a week. 
um, outside of your regular job. And that, that money from the CD store bought every time a new spawn set came out or a mon- movie monsters or whatever he made, um, she's like, you'd buy the whole set. Uh, and she's like, you just loved his stuff, the tortured souls, like all that stuff. Um, yeah. So I'm like, thanks for letting me do that. And she's like, uh, my mom always says, she goes, there is way worse things you could have been into at that age. And she's like, so I didn't mind you buying toys. She's like, I didn't care. And I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Tortured souls, big fan of Clive Barker as well. <laughs> yeah. He's awesome. Um, that's really cool. So, so with, um, with spawn in particular, mm-hmm. uh, like you said, you got the compendium, which the second volume will be coming out soon too, which is great. Again, right um, around Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I know. Of course. Right. <laughs> it's like, so they drop everything and we all go broke. Um, the, I hope, because one thing that frustrates me uh, with uh, McFarlane and Image is that they have problems consistently releasing uh, trades for Ven- or Spawn. I mean, yeah. um, they did the Origins collection up to about issue 122, and then they stopped those. And then they jumped ahead to the the uh, Star- Starling, Jim Starling stuff or what? Not Jim Starling, uh, the, the, the new Spawn, the white guy. Um, they jumped ahead to that. And then they when they got to issue 200, they skipped. They never put that in a trade. Issue yeah. 300 is not currently in a trade. They stopped right before that. Yeah. So I hope that these compendiums are a way for us to just get the first 300 issues in six compendiums. That would be great. I, I think that's their plan. Okay, good. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think um, there's a guy on Reddit who like works at Image. Oh, okay. And he posts in the spawn board. Well, not board. There's no message boards anymore. It's all Reddit. Right. <laughs> um <laughs> But he posts in the Spawn subreddit, and he says, like, I think they're already laying out Volume 3. Oh, great. Oh, that's amazing. Um, Because I own every individual issue in print and in digital. Um, And then I even went further and bought, uh, they did this thing where, this is how I met um, Christelle, who was uh, someone I was on their show not too long ago. She works for this uh, thing called Traveling Stories, and they do um, charity work. Yeah. And so they had this one where if you donated like 50 bucks, you got pretty much the first 200 issues of Spawn sent to you in PDF form. Um, and I, so I spent the 50 bucks and, and they, and they emailed it to me uh, with all the links to download it. And uh, I'm like, I already own these digitally, but <laughs> I just wanted to do something nice for a charity. And yeah. then I was like, well, these, I can get better screenshots off of uh, whenever I, if I ever make a Spawn show one day. Um, That's yeah. true. So, so, but even still that I want the compendiums, like <laughs> I have to have every, everything. Yeah. I mean, with shipping delays and everything, volume one was actually kind of hard to get. That's what I, yeah, that's what I heard. Cause I, I didn't put in my order for it and then I was going to pre-order it and then I had to cancel it cause I had to, I needed that money for food and then I never got around to getting it again. But I think at some point, if I have a little extra money during the holidays, I'll, my two things are, I want to buy the new Halo game and I want to get the first compendium of Spawn. So I think I'm going to aim for that. Yeah, I think they did a second print run of it, so it's easier to find now. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, sweet. That's excellent. So it, having re-reading that now, like you said, the art, like you can, you can tell, like it's aged a bit. Um, but that character in specific, like what is it about his origins that you like? And then we can get into like the newer stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it kind of goes along with for a little bit there, kind of like, you know, still liking Venom and everything, but it was like, you know, getting into like Star Wars and um, Jurassic Park was really big when I was a kid too. Particularly the second film came out when I was in like, I'm trying to think, second or third grade. So it was very, very popular. Um, And, but then, you know, like again, Freddy Krueger kind of coming into my life and coming back around to some of that stuff. It, It truly is like Spawn's association with like more horror elements. Right. He's kind of like an even more horror version of Venom in that regard. Absolutely. Um, he even has a symbiote, actually. Yeah. His, his cape. <laughs> and they kind of go back and forth about how much they talk about that. But, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. They don't use the word like fluidly, but yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. That's cool. You you would get along with my friend Nate, too. Nate is a big fan of dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Uh, and so he kind of, that's always in his head, too. But he does, unlike you and I, he does not like movie monsters that much. Yeah. No. Love movie monsters. They're awesome. <laughs> um, and is there anything about, because um, like you said, he, he kind of got swept up in that monster craze with you. Like uh, even beyond that, like it, do you, are there things about Al Simmons or, or, or Spawn that you like that um, you find the appeal that keeps you like coming back or is it just visuals with him? 
it's it's more than visuals. I mean, he's <clears throat> excuse me, he's an interestingly written character. Regardless, you know, um, I will certainly say at present he's a little abrasive all the time. Oh my god, yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's angry. He's very angry. You know? Yeah, um, but you know, um, for me, like I, I think my biggest thing for like getting me into Spawn, like writing wise and everything, was um, the animated series on HBO. Great call. Yeah. yeah. Cause it kind of presents those early issues in a more streamlined sense kind of, and it removed a lot of the having finally gotten around to reading those early issues in the last you know year or two because of the pandemic. Right. Um, some stuff that I would call a little too coincidental. Sure. There's a lot of um, coincidental events happening in that book. Yeah. Like Al being so associated with um, Billy Kincaid. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, missed my chance the first time. Like, I gotta say, someone like Billy Kincaid, you don't miss your chance. <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. Yeah. For those who don't know, Bill, Billy Kincaid is like a, a he's he's a the son of a senator, and he drives around in a ice cream truck and kidnaps and kills children. Um. Yeah. He's a monster. And uh, and yeah, like you said, when you get your shot at that guy, you don't miss. You don't blink. You yeah. take the guy down. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I felt like, um, and the comic in the early days is like it's a little all over the place because it, it starts off and you have Al just awake and he's spawn, and you're yeah. just like he's so it literally just throws you into the beginning of of his post life journey, um, yeah. which uh, I can certainly appreciate <laughs> post aneurysm. But I when I'm reading or was rereading it, I'm like, so this guy has no idea who he is and that he made a deal with the devil and that's kind of the early arcs but then they they just pile shit on him right away like yeah like, yeah he doesn't get a chance to really try to figure things out but i think that's mal bolger's plan is like i can't have this guy thinking i need him to do what i want him to do um yeah that didn't work it yeah no mal bolger's kind of an idiot <laughs> yeah. um so with the the new comics, because I, I know uh, um, I'm already keeping you 35 minutes, so I'll try to wrap this up. But that's okay. I don't have a lot of people to talk spawn with, actually. It's so the new comics. I mean, now we have three, and pretty soon we'll have a fourth yeah, monthly December, spawn yeah. book. Yeah, we'll have the Scorched, which is like a team book. Um, but right now we have King Spawn. We have the monthly Spawn book, which is up to issue 323. King yeah. Spawn is on issue three, and then this week we got Gunslinger Spawn. Um, as a Spawn fan, are you excited or is this overkill to have this many Spawn books in a month? I mean, I, I think it's good. I mean, I kind of agree with Todd. It's like when he was like, you know, Spawn fans only get to go to the comic book store like once a month. Right. Like you were telling me there was a while where you were only going to pick up Spawn. Does it? So, yeah, for like yeah. four months. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's a very small pull list. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I basically just got all four covers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, like, I think it's good because Spawn's like, it's a big universe. And in terms of like spinoffs and secondary books, it's been very inconsistent over the years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if this, if this can be good, you know, and keep going, I think that's good, you know, but if it's going to be crap, like shrink yeah. it back, <laughs> bring it, bring it back down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's how I feel. Like I, um, cause I'm already noticing like in the, when King Spawn first started, you can see where it it picks up, you know, outside of the main spawn book. Yes. But this week we got three spawn books in one week, which was not their plan. Their plan was originally to have one a week. Yes. Um, and so hopefully, even if they have to take a month off, I hope they get onto that schedule where we get yes. one a week. Because uh, reading this all, I am like, I don't know what order to read it in. And and then I read one, and I go, okay, so this clearly happens before this issue, and there's no like or this has happening in contradiction of even of this issue because spawns in two places at once. So um, with that, like, are you finding yourself lost in any way or are you like, eh, it's not that important because each individual issue has been solid so far. Um, I mean, a little bit, like I'll go and pick up my, my pull list and I'll just kind of like try to put it in order of like when it came out. Okay. Fair enough. And then I'll read through it. Um, you know, it certainly wasn't as bad as like, with King and Black, for example, the tie-ins didn't matter as much, but it was like, I remember for like, I think it was the last issue of mm -hmm. King and Black and the last issue of the King and Black tie-in Venom. I think you were definitely supposed to have read Venom first. 
Right. Yeah. But I think so. with absolute carnage, it was the opposite. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> I read um, King in Black first, and then I was like, oh, and as oh. I was reading that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know sometimes they'll put in there like, uh, read this before this issue sometimes. Um, not always though. Uh, certainly not in this, in the spawn thing. Um, they didn't really do that. Uh, but I, I still, even though all three came out at once, I tried to read them in the order that I thought they were supposed to release in. Yes. Um, but in King spawn, we have, so Billy Kincaid, for those wondering, he was dead. He eventually died. He got, he was killed pretty early in the spawn books. Um, but he's now back as some kind of demon. And so Spawn has to deal with him again in some new thing called Psalm 137, which is like a cult of people who yes. want to use children to like poison the world in a way. Um, and then you have Gunslinger Spawn, who was created by David Hine in like issue 175 and 176 yes. of Spawn or somewhere around there. Okay. And he's like a, from 1863 or 1864, and he's been sucked out of time because Al Simmons, this is so crazy. It's I realize like when I try to explain Spawn, it's uh, my head starts hurting. Uh, yeah. Al Simmons put into motion some big plan that cut off access from Earth to heaven and hell. Yeah. So so now everyone in heaven and hell that are on the other side that can't get to Earth are freaking out. And then people who die on Earth, their souls can't go on to heaven or hell. So yeah. it seems like a nightmare scenario. But but Al thinks this is the right thing to do. So I'm really concerned for Al, uh, I guess. Uh, I, I'm really worried his state of mind is, and as you said, he's angry. He's yelling at everybody. He's not yeah. making any friends, yet he's surrounded by allies for the first time ever, I think, since he's ever created. So I, I, I like the dichotomy of all that. So yeah. what is it about the new stories that are you know, appealing to you? Like, and, and do you have a favorite of the new spawns? Um, <clears throat> of the books, I'm certainly enjoying King Spawn the most. It's a good book. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, I'm trying to think. Um, you know, like, I'm, I'm interested where Gunslinger Spawn's going to go. Sure. Because it was sort of like, you know, he was always a popular character. I remember the figure they did of him back in the day was yeah. like one of those hot collectibles. He's so, so cool. you know, and just because he looks cool. Like, let's he does honest. look awesome. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, you know, stuff like that. And I'm, I'm interested how um the redeemer is going to end up figuring into this because he's been kind of prominently featured as a character in this sure like as and, they and, talk about him being in it right and he seems to have a connection to haunt although yes. haunt's brother says i've never met that guy before yeah and that's the thing too because like i'm only peripherally aware with um when it comes to haunt but mm -hmm. You know, for a lot of people it was like a big deal when he appeared in one of the sections of i think king spawn one yeah i was very excited <laughs> yeah so you know i'm like that's cool and it'll be interesting to see like you know haunt interact with al simmons presumably in the scorch perhaps yeah because um haunt is a character created by robert kirkman who created yes. the walking dead obviously and he um he did appear a couple times in spawn or spawn appeared in his book but it was when the white guy was spawn um and i can't remember his name it's like Sterling. jim downing Jim Downing. That's it. I'm always, I want to say Jim Starling. That's a different comic book guy. Uh, he's a real person. Um, so yeah, uh, Jim Downing. And, uh, and so he popped up, they met a couple of times, but yeah, now he has a chance to meet Al Simmons and I'm curious to see where that goes. And, uh, and I'm liking all the relationships they're building up uh, that you mentioned King Spawn being your favorite. <clears throat> what I like about that book is we're three issues in and there's a clear narrative they're telling with it. it it's it, much more streamlined. It's very, it's very much one person's idea with Todd probably interjecting here and there um, to tie it to the bigger realm. Yeah. But really it is about this Psalm 137 group, Billy Kincaid returning and ha having like a single focus um, in the middle of all this chaos. And like Spawn, like this week, he like randomly is held up in a shack and he fights vampires. And I'm like, where did this come from? Uh, it was a good issue, but I was still like, yeah. was that set up? I, I don't understand. Um and then Gunslinger Spawn, again, my favorite thing about Gunslinger Spawn that they've addressed in the first book is they've already came out and said in the first issue, he, out of all the spawns that have ever been in throughout time and stuff, he's the weakest. Um, and what I like about that is that that means he's the underdog that, like, that I feel like I'm going to be rooting for. Yeah. Because if he's surrounded by super powerful people, like Spawn 
is literally almost a god at this point. So right. you you don't really feel like when he was fighting that vampire, I'm like, he's going to kill this guy. And then he rips his head right off. And I'm like, yeah, OK, I wasn't worried about Spawn for two seconds, uh, despite them trying to make me feel like I was going to be scared of, of his death. But um, but Gunslinger Spawn, I'm worried will die. <laughs> like, I'm actually worried that guy's going to die. And the way he he has to dip his his bullets into his own blood to, like, kill archangels. I'm like, and so that makes him weaker. I'm like, I love, like, already he's way more interesting in a lot of ways, character-wise, than some of the stuff they're doing with even Al, who I love. But like you said, right now, he's just like a, he's a guy with a plan, but he's very angry. And I feel like his plan is not, um, it's not a good one. So, yeah. uh, but that, I think that's what will make this so interesting is that Al's the chosen one, but I think Al's, Al needs to still figure out who Al is. And I, I love that he's reteaming up with Terry right now because I think that will hopefully bring that humanity side back out of Al. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, hopefully. they don't seem super happy to see each other. But... No, they're definitely not friends anymore. Yeah. Um, but but I like I like that they're trying these new things with Spawn and the character. And um, where do you hope this goes? Like, do you like I know you said you hope this just is good and continues to be four books, but do you want this to have an end game at some point like would you like to see a conclusion to spawn because this seems like such a big idea they're setting up and i'm like what do you do after this like after you cut off the access to heaven and hell like what could you possibly do for the next story <laughs> like yeah um i mean i i think I've, I've seen other people talking about it and i haven't really picked up on these hints but there's been some hints that like mal bulger is coming back interesting okay um i've, I've seen people saying that i believe them yeah <laughs> so sure you know, sure um that's that could be an interesting way to go that's true you know, i i think there's i don't necessarily mean the show or the show the comics need like a clear end point but you know the reason i think a lot of people were kind of getting tired with spawn before this new stuff was because it was like constantly setting up things and then it would just keep going without any real payoff sure so, you know, even if it's, it still keeps going, like punctuating the storylines sure. a bit more, I think is important. I agree. I think the the first time I really see, seen them do that was kind of with Jim Downing. Yeah. I felt like they had a plan with him beginning, middle and end. And when it ended, he's still around and he's still a part of the story in the background. But it was, there was a clear torch pass and return for Al. Um, and I thought they, they nailed that. So, uh, so maybe they are thinking that way and that would be great to end this story, but still have enough lingering to keep it going, which would be fantastic. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things they could do. There's a lot of antagonists and there's new ones as well. Sure. I mean, just since issue 300, I think we got like 15 new villains. So yeah, I mean, and even more in uh, spawns universe. Yeah. Oh yeah. Spawn so. universe. That's right. It just dropped a whole bunch on us. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> no, I let, let's safely assume the violator is going to show up again. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, that was, there's no way he's gone again forever. Um, well, that's cool. I I'm, I'm glad you're a spawn fan too. And, uh, and I, and again, I thank you not only for your time tonight, but just for, you know, even checking out my show and then liking it enough to throw me those codes. Like, so I could share that with everyone. It again, I can't thank you enough. I thought that just helped the channel in big ways and it gave me fun things to talk about and i'm, I'm glad yeah. i ended up liking a lot of those books oh yeah no i mean i had kind of fallen away from comics in a pretty big way not like i didn't ever really read a lot of single issues but you know i would read trades and stuff like that and i think it was through some older videos of yours that i even found out eddie brock with venom again <laughs> oh wow okay so i was like well I'll pick up that trade and so i, I read the run before donny cates and trades Okay, um, which I definitely yeah. preferred to Donny Cates. Well, yeah, and I'm I'm about to go through the rest of that pretty soon after se episode 700. So uh, I'm I'm excited because uh, that that was the the run that was happening when I started this show. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, I'm I'm glad you found out no, you know, and uh, that I was your gateway to Eddie's return. That's uh, that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Sweet. Um. Well, before I let you go, any any last things you want to uh, talk about, or any last things you want to say? Um, let me think. Uh, I mean, I don't know. What do you think about the Spawn movie? Oh, you know, uh, yeah, that's right. I should have touched on that. Actually, the Spawn movie was, um, I liked it ish. Like, I think it was cast. Well, I think John Leguizamo was a great choice for clown. 
Mm-hmm. And I think um, uh, uh, Michael Jai White, well, I mean, that put him on the map, I think, for me. And I, I'm, I'm still a huge fan of that guy. Uh, so he's a good choice for Al. I just think um, everything else just felt like, I don't know, like when I think of, I don't even mind that it was PG-13. I think for me, I mean, I can't tell you what I felt when I first watched the movie, yeah. but when I watched it post aneurysm, I think I had read the comic again and then I watched the movie and I said, you know, I think what this thing lacks is um, just intensity in any form. An edge. Um, yeah, like it just any kind of edge. like Because it, it's, it's got a great soundtrack. I, I, but again, even if they didn't want to make it rated R, that's fine. I just felt like it it did lack an edge to it. And uh, and I don't think it committed to the world as much uh, in some ways that, that is set up in the comics. And I don't know. I think uh, I think there's some missed opportunities there. And, and hopefully whatever new movie they make is has some kind of bite to it. Whether it's R or not, I don't care. But if it has a bite to it, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that with the Spawn movie and it's because that was New Line Cinema, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. And they did this with The Mask as well, where like they made these perplexing choices where they were like, we need a new Freddy Krueger. But then they constantly yeah. watered them down. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, there's a little bit of that going over at Sony uh, actually right now, too. So uh, they're like, we want this, but we want a, like an, a watered down version. And it's yeah. like, no, that's fine. I mean you can make that work. It's just, uh, you just need the right person to do it. And I can't remember who directed the spawn movie, but I don't know if, I don't know if they were a good choice. Yeah. I I don't know either. I mean, I, uh, I don't know if you would have done this, but I read all the leaked emails when Sony got hacked. Oh yeah. Yeah, I I did. And, uh, I don't know how those people find their houses at the end of the day. (laughs) Movie company. (laughs) I, so you might you might find some of those emails because there's a I've sent a couple emails to like Amy Pascal and stuff with my Spider-Man yeah. Four script. So uh, so I'm I was working at Sony d- uh, during this time of those email leaks. So uh, it was funny. Um, I yeah I know. So I, I mean yeah I know. There there I've worked with a lot of people in my life where I'm like, how do you put your pants on? <laughs> like how do you get dressed? I'm so blown away by that. Like yeah. how do you know to eat? Like. Um, yeah. Yeah, so th- there are there are people like that. I mean, everyone has that. You can you can find that kind of person anywhere. What's hard for fans like us is that when those people work in movies, uh, it, it it does it like we get worried. We're like, oh Jesus. Um, but they, I don't know. Spawn. I think um, I think it's you know they were just trying to capitalize on a, a major comic, and that's what Hollywood always does. Is they're like, oh, this thing's making money without us. Well, then it should make money with us. Yeah. And that's you kind of how, you know, that's how that business works. So I don't blame them for trying, but the, the problem was is they like all the, always when they get a franchise, they don't really understand it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so they just hire people that have a take on it and then they just run with that. And I think that's why McFarlane's having such a trouble making his new version is because he's probably constantly being brought into meetings with people who don't really understand the universe and yeah. that could be good. I mean, I think I think that could be. You still need someone with an outside perspective. Um, and Todd, as much as I love him, he's not always the best writer. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, so, say, I don't know if you've read the draft of the script that's on the internet. I have. Oh yeah, the the, the detective one with Twitch. Yeah, it's it's not a good script. <laughs> It's not a good script, but it's one of those where, like, if I was a director, I feel like there's a enough of a foundation there where I could work with it, but I would have to add stuff um, for sure and change things. But I feel like it's it's enough of a foundation where I'm like, okay, if this is the tone you're going for, we could probably capture that. But you need a little bit more of this and this, and you need to change this, and and that's the thing is that's probably what he's going through, and he I don't know if he's uh, interested in their ideas, you know. Um, so we'll have to, I guess we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, like, and not in like a negative way, it just, it reads like, it reads like the sequel he was trying to make to the last Spawn movie. Like it's, it reads like a directed video script. It does. And if it was being like made for $12 million for Netflix, then yeah. I'd probably be on board for it. Um, but uh, if it's, if they want to make it, I mean, I don't know, for me, Spawn is you, because of his look you need a budget, but yeah. because of the tone, like his tone and his look c- contrast. So yeah. it, it's perfect for a comic or an animated series, 
but to do a, a live action movie, it's like, well, you need money to make him look like Spawn, but then you, and then he has to fight a mo- like monsters, like a, a cy- cybernetic gorilla and a, and a giant demon. So you need money for that. So that doesn't look bad, but then you're trying to tell this like, you know, small intimate story. And it's like, if you want to do those, make them one-off episodes in an ongoing animated series and just yeah. do it that way. You know? Yeah. I think that, um, <sighs> It, like the problem for me with like with the script was that I found the way he wrote Twitch was like this guy is very unlikable in the script. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know, sorry for the Jeremy Renner fans, but like he ain't the actor to make you like that character. No, Twitch is um, <clears throat> Twitch is a bookworm, you know, uh, and he he may be unlikable at times as far as like you think maybe he's a little too. Well, this is weird because he's not an arrogant guy. He's quirky. Um, and he's certainly the smartest guy in the room. But what I like about him and Sam together is that he makes good ideas feel like they're Sam's ideas. Yeah. Uh, because he knows that's how you have to handle Sam. Sam is like a big, overweight, braggart, uh, D-bag cop uh, who's like pretty stereotypical, eats donuts, all that stuff. And, uh, and he's not very smart. And you need Twitch to be the smartest guy in the room but make every idea feel like it's Sam's idea. So Sam can continue to be a bragger. And he's like, yeah, I'm glad I came up with that idea, Twitch. And uh, yeah. so you, you need that. And none of that's in the script. Like, yeah. You know, they, they need that dynamic. And Sam's just straight up yeah. not in the script. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, he's just not there. And I'm like, well, that's, that's what makes Twitch work is that there's a Sam, you know, and you kind of need it. Yeah, I don't know. Like if, if it were me, like if you want to make a smaller horror movie about Spawn, like, why isn't it about Billy Kincaid? I mean, yeah. I mean, there's, I always thought like, because there's like, there's been a bunch of different ideas where you could have a Sam and Twitch story where they're after a serial killer. And then in the end, you find out the serial killer is a demon and then Spawn shows up and he's like a part of it. It's like, you can do that story. It's just, but why I, some on some level, I'm kind of like, why? Like, unless it's an episode of a show, I, I think that works if you did, or if they did like, um, What's that? R.L. Stein did something recently on Netflix, which was like a trilogy of movies. Uh, oh Street. yeah, yeah, the Fear Street movies. So if you if if Netflix was like, hey, here's sixty million dollars. It's twenty million dollars per Spawn movie. You can do these three things, and you can set it in different parts of time, like Fear Street did. You could do Gunslinger Spawn, Medieval Spawn, and Regular Spawn. You can have a connecting thread if you wanted to. You could come up with these things and and approach it that way. But I think it would work better in that format, and not something that you're going to release in the theater for uh, aspirations of making hundreds of millions of dollars. I just don't see that working. I, I think what Todd should probably do is do what Frank Miller did with Sin City, get a well-known director to direct the movie with him. Amen. And, fi- and finance it yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jason Blum is producing it. Jason Blum can get that money. Like sure. After sure. 10 years of no Halloween films, we have three coming. <laughs> right. So True. <laughs> like Jason Blum can get it done. It's just you're selling people a script called Spawn that Spawn is not in. Exactly. And so change either change the title of the Sam and Twitch and add Sam to it, and then Spawn can make his cameos. Yeah. Um, or like you said, but, but but package it and sell it to what you're actually selling. Yeah. And I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I, I think you could still keep the budget. Like I, I think that the ceiling should be like fifty million dollars if you want to make sure it can be affordable. Yeah. Like a Resident Evil budget. That's what, yeah, that's perfect. You know, and you can still have Spawn in the movie. Just do what the animated series did and just have him be like a cowl with eyes staring out at you <laughs> from like an alley. Yeah, he's like a specter. You know, he's um he's this thing that doesn't want to be involved. And then yeah. that's his downfall is that apathy is like taken over. I really like the animated version of him where he's this, he's angry when people cross his path, but he's really just apathetic. Like he just doesn't, yeah care about anybody and I, I think that's great i mean it's a hell of, a, of its own is apathy so uh, yeah the cartoon just did it really well i agree with what you said earlier it's such a good version it's probably my favorite version of spawn actually is the cartoon. yeah I, uh, so I, I i don't remember how long after the movie it came out but like a year or so mm-hmm. so i was pretty young when it came out and i didn't realize the audience it was intended for oh yeah for, for so I, I taped it and i got grounded for taping it <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's like boobs and everything in that show yeah yeah um yeah there's and there's like hardcore stuff like yeah that show was there are people are sh- doing drugs and like yeah, it's, 
it's a gnarly show, but it's awesome. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, I rewatched it like in the early days when we were all locked down. I was like, this holds up. Yeah, it does. It really does. It holds up better than any other interpretation of the character, I feel. Yeah. Um, that's cool. Yeah, no. Yeah, so if you're out there and if you want to get into Spawn, the current comics are good. You're going to be a little lost, so make sure you pick up, uh, is it Vengeance? Is the trade that has issues 296 and 297 in it? That will give so. you, that gives you a recap of the first 295 issues in two issues. Um, so it's a good, actually what McFarlane should do is he should print those two issues and issue number one in like a little 799 page book. Um, yeah. That would be great. And then put it out there like, hey, you want to jump into Spawn? Here's Spawn issue zero or whatever. Um, yeah, it's not a bad entry point, I think, you know. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's it's a lot of shit to read. and But that's the thing is it was a 299 comic and you're reading an overview of 295 issues in two books. I'm like, well, I got my money's worth. I mean, holy cow. Like I, I haven't seen a Marvel or DC book pack that much into 20 pages ever in like a long time. Yeah, no, I yeah. Mean i enjoy some of the marvel books but i always find myself like okay i guess see you in a month yeah that's, that's how i felt after reading the newest issue of spider-man i was like all right i, I well there goes four dollars um <laughs> but uh but awesome well cam i i yeah i gotta i don't want to keep you too long we've been an hour already but um you've been awesome man and I, i'm thanks for asking me about the spawn movie i should have mentioned that earlier that was uh it's uh the soundtrack to me is the most memorable thing about that movie yeah, there's parts I like of it, but it's talk about of its time. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely dated for sure. It was even dated when it came out a little bit, but uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, but yeah. So keep keep the crown on, man. Keep being a Spawn fan. Um, you know, at some point down the road, maybe uh, after we get to like another milestone of these books, maybe I'll just have you back on for a Seek and Destroy episode, and we can talk more Spawn stuff at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe after all four books have been running for a little bit. There you go. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, we'll get through their first arcs and we can take notes and, and chat about it. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And so all of you out there, um, Kim, do you have a presence on social media? Do you do any of that stuff? Not really. I mean, <laughs> okay. I, I'm on Twitter, but like I talk about like Canadian politics a lot and people. Don't okay. Care about that. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, good luck with all that uh, up there too. And, uh, and everyone who d does want to talk to Cam, just look for him in the comment section. Uh, yeah. he's, he's, he pops in from time to time and, He's been really awesome and a big supporter of this show. And, and for that, I'll always be grateful to you, sir. No problem. Awesome. Oh, and uh, thank you for being here tonight, man. I, I appreciate that too. Oh, no problem. Happy to do it. <laughs> oh, thank you. And uh, everyone else, thank you so much for watching the show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you all in the future. Peace.